Now, the allegation that the Islamic concept of paradise has, been, has made Muslims become belligerent and has incited them to do jihad is also unjust. In the verse I have just quoted, Allah the Almighty has clearly said that he does not like transgressors. If Allah does not like a person, there can be no question of him entering paradise. What are the standards of dealing with transgression? This also is a unique teaching. Unless one believes in Allah, the Almighty, and unless one has his fear in one's heart, one cannot reach such high standards. Allah the Almighty says in the Holy Quran, O ye who believe, be steadfast in the cause of Allah, bearing witness in iniquity, and let not people's enmity incite you to act otherwise than with justice. Be always just that is nearer to righteousness and fear Allah. Allah is aware of what you do. Chapter 5, verse 9. This verse tells us if you are a true believer, then acting on the commandments of God Almighty, be just and steadfast in them. What are the requirements of justice? Firstly, make your deeds be in accordance with the teachings of Islam and become role model for others. Can a terrorist be a role model or an exemplar for others? In this age, it is not only non-Muslims, but also a majority of Muslims uh, who do not like terrorists or suicide bombers. So it is only good deeds which will attract others and not evil deeds. Also in this verse, amongst the many good deeds that a Muslim has been asked to do, one good deed towards which our attention has been drawn regards enemies. I have briefly mentioned the conditions that prevailed before the migration and then those that existed after it. Now, in that context, consider this commandment which states that the people's enmity should not move you away from justice. One can see that Islamic teachings are meant for the establishment of justice. If there are wars, they should conform to the law. For example, it is commanded, if you make prisoners, treat them kindly. Then, if the enemy lays down their arms, justice demands, and moreover, it is necessary for the establishment of peace. That hostilities should cease immediately. By contrast in this civilized age if two parties are meeting in view of ending the war between them then at the last moment one party strikes so much terror into the hearts of the others by non-stop bombardments that the stronger party are then able to force the weaker, weaker party to agree to all the conditions they impose. Allah the Almighty guides the Muslims, declaring, and if they incline towards peace, you should also incline towards it, and put your trust in Allah. Surely it is He who is all-hearing, all-knowing. Chapter 8, verse 62. So the teaching is that if the enemy is inclined towards peace, then you should also be inclined towards it. The teaching is to put your trust in Allah because it may well be that the enemy is extending his hand only to regain his strength and is not doing so with good intentions. But despite this, you are ordered to extend your hand 
in peace and place your trust in Allah and to withdraw from war immediately. You are not allowed to give precedence to military strategy. Hence, during this Treaty of Hudaybiyah, in spite of insistence uh, of the companions and, despi and uh, despite uh, having the upper hand, the Holy Prophet وسلم, agreed to the conditions of the disbelievers of Makkah. Even the invasion of Makkah was because the disbelievers had violated a treaty. But despite the fact that the Muslims were now the victors, whosoever did not raise arms against them was allowed to live in peace as a disbeliever. Even the bitter, bitterest enemies were forgiven. These facts are not hidden. They have been witnessed by history. Alas, in spite of all this, some Western media and politicians have not refrained from making Islam, the Quran, and the Holy Prophet وسلم, their targets. The cartoons depicting the Holy Prophet وسلم, in certain newspapers and the statements made by an MP of Holland who made a film also targeted the Holy Quran and the Holy Prophet, peace and blessing of Allah be upon him. The Muslims consider any prophet, peace be on them all, mentioned in any religious book as a true prophet. Therefore, no Muslim, and for that matter, no Ahmadi Muslim, who believes in the promised Messiah of this age, can be expected to resort to insults or slander. We have been taught in the Holy Quran that as prophets of God, all the prophets are equal. Furthermore, God says, I have sent prophets to all people. Therefore, we accept any prophet without hesitation who was sent to any nation that claims a prophet came amongst them. <laughs> Incidentally, according to us, this is the only way to maintain the peace in the world at the moment. The feelings and sentiments of every religion and people should be respected. I have already told you in what situation and under what conditions war has been permitted. But the question is, are such religious war permitted in this age? And if not, what is the significance of jihad? And what is the in interpretation of jihad according to Ahmadis? But before this, I want to say in passing that the wars of the last few centuries were mainly political and geographical in nature and were rarely waged because of religion. Moreover, during the last century, two world wars were fought in which the Muslims played no major role. And these were exclusively because of political interests. Before accusing Islam of being a religion of terrorism, justice requires that those who make allegations should also consider the cause of the wars in question. In any case, I want to briefly present the definition of jihad as given by the founder of the Ahmadiyya community and to say how one can engage in it in this present age. In the developed world of our time, everybody has the right to practice, to preach, and to profess his faith. In other words, the conditions for war that I had mentioned do not exist. Then what is the uproar about jihad? I therefore want to explain the kind of jihad our community believes in, in the present age.